My name is Zahn Eastis, and I'll call us to order here for the regular meeting of the Open Select Board on Monday, December the 11th. It's 6.30 p.m. Uh, welcome to everyone here in the room. It's nice to see everyone, and welcome to those folks online. Um, we'll begin the meeting by asking Rusty to read the rules of procedure. Thanks, Rusty. The, <clears throat> the Select Board has a set of rules and procedures that are for all Guilford public meetings and are now shared with all committees and commissions. They are here in the chat online and published on the town website. These rules request that everyone present at the meeting conduct themselves in a civil manner. Tonight, individuals will have a reasonable time to comment on actions the select board is considering. Comments and questions will inform the select board's decision-making process. Individual comments will be limited to three minutes. Comments will be heard, not responded to. There will be no exchange between the select board and a commenter. No questions will be responded to. Any questions will be recorded and responded to in a timely fashion. Additionally, here in the room and in the chat online, there is some basic information, which includes how to contact select board members, how to secure a spot during the community comment portion of the meeting, how to get on the agenda, and how to communicate with the board via mail or email. Thank you, Rusty. Thanks very much. All right, so then we'll move right on to a welcoming of the public. And can yeah. you come up here? Is there um, anything? So, no, I uh, communicated, well, I reached out to a few different people. And unless somebody in the room has a community comment that you would like to share, then we can move on to the audience. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody? Oh, there's Steve. Oh, Steve. I, I was going to do it in the trust uh, portion of it, but I would like to make sure that everybody knows that after a three-year pandemic-induced hiatus, the Green River Carol Sing is back on for next Sunday night, 5 p.m. at the Green River Church. Uh, we've got Michael Mario coming back uh, as the leader, and uh, Ned Phoenix, who uh, this past uh, spring repaired the historic SD organ, is going to play the organ and, and let us know how it sounds the way it's really supposed to be played. Uh, <laughs> And anyway, it, uh, we're, we're going to serve uh, cider and uh, seasonal treats in the vestibule after the service. So everybody's invited and hope to see you there. So that's the 17th, December 17th, 17th 5 p.m.? 5 p.m. Thank you so much. Great. So glad to hear that. Great. Thanks. All right, we'll move on in the agenda to changes to the agenda order. We have one. Um, we uh, we need to uh, add to new business. We need to authorize our, t our town administrator to make renewal uh, for the Algiers Central Village designation it has a deadline of early January. So we need to um, vote on that later this evening if the select board's comfortable adding that. that should be a small item. All right. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to approving the minutes of the previous meeting, which was November 27th. Is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Michael. Second. second. Thank you, Brenda. Is there any discussion? Thank you. All right. We'll take a vote. We can take a voice vote here. So all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, uh, any abstentions or any uh, nays? Thank you. All right, then we move ahead to updates and reports. We'll uh, ask um, Erica to talk to us as town administrator for a few moments. Oh. Hi everybody, it's nice to see you all here. Um, just want to remind you all that this is the last select board meeting of this calendar year. Um, the next the next select board meeting will be January 8th, I believe. Um, let Sheila in. Um, okay, so, and also we have a budget workshop coming up this Thursday, um, December 14th, and that'll be at 8.30 a.m. And it may be our last budget workshop before we uh, are finished doing that work. Um, so that will be very exciting. The, um, I met with uh, the town auditors, Leslie and Kathy, and also Ellie, our treasurer, and Sheila Morse. Thank you. For, um, came to that meeting, and we discussed the town report. And I've been collecting all the various reports and um, requests from the social service folks and uh, just the various people that need to submit things for the town report. Mm -hmm. And that's going pretty well. And 
Um, I completed the grant that I believe we talked about last meeting um, with the help of Wyndham Regional Commission. It's a municipal stormwater grant application uh, for this uh, culvert on Slate Rock Road. So that's submitted and we'll hear sometime in the spring whether we uh, got the grant and we'll get to decide what to do with it then. I attended um, the Wyndham County Sheriff's Office Animal Control meeting and got their budget numbers for this year for what they're <coughs> requesting from all their member towns. I, um, our, the, the town office is looking for a assistant treasurer slash assistant administrative assistant to help Ellie and me uh, do our work and that job is posted now on Guilford's website so that's good and um, I coordinated with um, Don McLean at the Grange uh, talking about pre-town meeting and we'll talk about that later in this week all right thank you oh may i ask a question um for the commissions when is the deadline for the real deadline where they have to have their information and request in mid-december is mid-december okay right coming right up she said she wants it in the very beginning of january is the real okay. the drop dead as they say in okay publishing. <laughs> And is the um, assistant position a 20 hour or 10? It's, yeah, it's split between two assistant ten and ten. Yeah, it's 10 and 10, so. But it, yeah, it is flexible though, so. All right, we hope to find uh, the perfect person. <laughs> perfect, <laughs> flexible person. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There you go. Scale of it. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to comment that, uh, 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 Erica's comments tonight and usually are uh, from all parts of this job and it's very it's a very uh, uh, compartmentalized and out complicated set of tasks that Erica's overseeing and she's uh, doing it here for the first time in the first year really uh, pulling together a big uh, set of skills same with Ellie and same with Danielle all of whom are new in their positions here in the town so um, uh, kudos to the staff for the, all that they're learning. It's really impressive. So, but I also ask for uh, all of our patients as we help them through this for this first time around. So it's good. All right, um, let's talk with for a moment with a, a rather more seasoned uh, commissioner. That would be uh, Dan. Do right, you have a, a report about the highway for us, Dan? Yes, I do. Good evening. Good evening. Well, a lot of nature has been kind of nice to us so far. Uh, we haven't had much snow, which is nice. I don't care if it snows all winter. I guess we'll see this weather right, we're getting right now. But we've been out grading in between freezing and thawing. And, uh, this rain is, of course, it creates potholes. And the last couple of weeks, we've been, we were all caught up the other day. And then, of course, we've got this rain, so we've got a few more places we've got to touch up with it if the weather thaws out or not. Um, I got to, we're going to go back to cut and brush here pretty quick. I want to finish up Hinesburg Hill over there to get a bunch of stuff to cut and check. And we're going to start be cutting trees. Uh, some of, a lot of the dead ones around, so I'm just going to just get the worst ones for now. And then we'll just, you know, we're going to be bouncing from road to road. So okay. uh, the equipment's holding up real good. I mean, we haven't used much sand or salt. Um, we've plowed once so far. Of course, when this time of year when nothing's frozen, you're trying to plow and you're trying to carry the plows, you get you get the chatter and thing, and it makes washing work. So, uh, other than that, everything's been going good. Our new man is working out very well. Oh, good. Um, and he's going to be a big, big help. Good. Glad to hear that. Yep. Good. Any questions for Dan? Sorry. I one question. Are you doing all the tree work, Danny? In the is yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can, and of course, I'll get a bucket oh. truck. A lot of them will get up, the dead ones will just get a bucket truck. Mm -hmm. It's rather be safe than somebody get hurt. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Folks, we'll move ahead to old business. Uh, we're in the process of hearing from tax exempt uh, pro uh, organizations that are will be proposing that that, that they that 
that they become tax exempt in the, in the near future. So we'll hear first from the uh, folks at the fire department. Uh, is that going to be you? Or? It can be. All right. Um, Why don't yeah. you, can you just, would you mind sliding up to this chair? Oh, sure. And just right so in the can, center. Yeah, so we can see you on, <laughs> on the right. camera there. Well, I guess um, I may need some guidance on what exactly you need to hear from us. I know um, we've course, er Erica and I have corresponded about drafting up the language. It sounds pretty standard. Um, so we're here to support that language, um, and I'm not sure what else you need from me, but happy to answer well, questions. Well, it might be just nice to just explain um, uh, quickly without much warning here sure. why uh, why you feel, that why the fire department feels it's important that, that the community consider this question, which is what we'll be considering. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think because of the services um, that the fire department has historically provided and will continue to provide into the future, um, the, the great benefit that it gives to the town um, and the, um, you know, the value of the property and all of the equipment and the expenses and everything that go into that, um, I think it behooves of the town to allow us to have a tax exempt status so that we can put that money to use in making sure that our men are, our men and women are trained and that our equipment is up to date and that we have everything we need to provide the services that we do. Great. Good. I don't, I don't, is anybody here have a question? Okay, well, like, we'll, we'll speak with you in a few minutes about the budget. Too. Sounds so, good. All right. <laughs> Thanks, great. So, um, how about we move on to the Green River present Preservation Act? So, Beth, you want to move over back Absolutely. over? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we're not the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what we do. <laughs> Welcome, Steve. Yeah, so give us the lowdown. I wrote a little thing that it's easier to read than it is to ramble. So, uh, uh, I'm Steve Lemke. I'm a trust uh, current, I'm the trust current secretary. I've been a trust board member for over 20 years. Uh, and sort of formally, on behalf of our entire board, I'm here tonight to request that the select board endorse a request for property tax exemption for the Green River Village Preservation Trust at the annual Guilford Town Meeting to be held in March 2024. We estimate the total tax assessment uh, for the trust to be approximately $1,200. Uh, the Green River Village Preservation Trust was formed in 1999 as a 501c3 non-profit non organization by Addie and Addison Myatt. The original purpose was to form a tax-exempt organization that could accept funds and grants for the rehabilitation and ongoing maintenance of the Green River Crib Dam. The rehabilitation of the dam was accomplished in 2000. <coughs> Today, the trust is, rec is a recognized non-profit 501c3 organization in good standing with the state of Vermont. It is dedicated to the preservation and public sharing of the historical, physical, and community resources of Green River Village and the surrounding area. Uh, under land ownership and maintenance responsibilities, people are often confused over what land and structures the trust owns and maintains within the village, and here are the answers. Fortunately, the town owns and maintains the covered bridge, so we slid out from underneath that one. Uh, the trust does own the dam and the adjacent land that comprises the upper and lower swimming areas, as well as the church, the churchyard, and the Green River Meadows project located seven-tenths of a mile south, south of the covered bridge. We voluntarily make all of our property available and accessible to the public. We work hard to maintain the areas, areas so they are safe and pleasing to the public. And on a side note, opening the area to the public requires that we are obligated to carry and pay for liability insurance. You don't just open things up to the public without being responsible for it. In addition to the regular mowing, raking, and general cleanup, we're responsible for maintaining the primary infrastructure of the dam, the fishway, and the church, which includes major projects such as the regular removal of sediment behind the dam, which we have to do now almost every two years. It used to be every five years, but now it's down to two. Um, due to Hurricane Irene, or Tropical Storm Irene, and all church repairs. Other than a much appreciated town tax exemption that we've had for years, we received no outside financial assistance from the town of the state. We are totally dependent on individual donations and grants to finance our projects. Uh, over the past two years, we have spent over $18,000 repairing the church, 
which was fascia boards, new stove piping, uh, painting the interior uh, of the ceiling. Uh, it's a 185 year old church, so maintaining it is, is not very easy, but I think we're, we're pretty proud to see it sitting there sort of white and stately, you know, in opposition to a lot of other churches that you drive by that are not looking so clean and stately. Uh, and we also spent $13,000 to remove sediment from behind the dam, which must be done every two years. So we're not talking about, you know, $5 here and $10 here. We're talking about thousands of dollars needed to do this. Uh, the board is a true working board comprised of 11 volunteers. <clears throat> the only maintenance work that we pay for is lawn mowing. All other routine seasonal chores and do-it-yourself projects are performed by the board members and others who are willing to help. Uh, it takes a lot of time, energy, planning, and money to carry out these duties. And physical and financial resources are further strained when extraordinary events such as storms and major repair projects arise and demand immediate attention and resources. The town tax exemption is critical to our efforts to accomplish our projects. The trust annually plays host to a countless number of swimmers, hikers, runners, fishermen, and general visitors. Um, we publish a mail and newsletter twice a year in the spring and fall, which I just happen to have some copies of. Thank you. That's the current one that just went out last week. Uh, we publish a newsletter twice a year, spring and fall, where we actually share news of what's happening in the village and we give a comprehensive listing and description of the projects we have recently completed and those we will undertake in the next six months. Um, so we have a pretty good following of what's going on and what we're working on and how to do it. So uh, we hope you will uh, endorse our request. Uh, last, we're asking for a six year exemption. Uh, so it's sort of staggered between so it really isn't up in that. And just for a matter of fact, the last exemption we had was for 10 years. So if you want to go for that, that's fine. <laughs> um, so anyway, just as a certain, certain note, uh, Mr. Becker is one of our members, Mr. Detcher is one of our members, and Lynn Pancake is one of our members. Uh -huh. So if you have any questions for any of us, Lynn's our treasurer, and, and uh, uh, I'm the secretary. Uh, Diane Murphy is the, is the president, and Steve is the vice president. Nice. So, so you're well represented here. This That's our request. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for uh, Green Reserve Preservation Group. I don't have any questions, but I just want to say how much that part of town has been in all of our minds and hearts. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, um, you know, maybe the minutes <clears throat> can include um, where to send donations, if that's appropriate. Well, I can address that in a couple ways. Um, and what we're talking about, I assume you're talking about the fire that struck the mine at residence. Yeah. And when you think of the church over here on the knoll and the red iconic farmhouse, mine farmhouse over here on the knoll, that's Green River. And then you got the dam and the, right. and the covered bridge. So um, it was struck on November 27th with a tragic fire. Um, it took about half the house down. Um, you know, dispensation of the house and what's going to happen is still undecided, but the, uh, you know, Addie, uh, passed away last spring. Yes. Addison, uh, age 93, has moved recently to yes. Langdon Place uh, as assisted living. So fortunately for that, it was no one was home to right. be involved in trying to fight the fire or uh, or, or or worse. So mm -hmm. um, there was a Christmas tree that we put up with hearts That's shaped good. on it, and we we're asking people if you could read about it in the newsletter. Uh, that if you are so inclined, you can make a heart that's weatherproof and windproof and hang it on the tree with a little message uh, for the miners. They have not asked that donations be um, sent in any way, shape, or form at this point. Um, there's the Green River Trust. Uh, when when Annie passed, one of her wishes as a as a donation was for the trust or for the when I think it was Humane Society. No, the historic the historical, historical museum society. Uh, society or the trust. So um, they're weathering the storm. They're a resilient and strong group. And I just want to say too, from the side of membership, um, Addison has moved to an emeritus status. So he you know, can't get on that tractor anymore. But his uh, daughter, uh, Priscilla, is joining the board. So the Addison, I mean, the Addison and Addie legacy will continue and, and uh, all the goodwill that they brought. And uh, you know, Addison came to a bunch of us 
uh, about 18 months ago or two years ago and said, I'm getting to a point where I got to pass this on. You know, so he did, and that's what we're doing. So it's a pleasure to work on the same things that they did so willingly, so wonderfully, and so quietly mm -hmm. at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'll just say that it's uh, um, our, um, our expectation of the select board that we will be forwarding as an article to the town meeting um, all of these tax exempt property requests and the, the town will vote on each of them. So, in, in, uh, separately, there'll be so many separate uh, articles. All right, we move on then to the next. Um, the ARPA request from the Emergency Management Director. Um, the Brenda and Rusty were going to serve as a, a subcommittee for us. Do you have a recommendation? Yeah, Rusty, do you want to talk about it? Sure. I talked to Erica and Brenda. We, we all agreed it should be approved. We figured it was a win-win situation because it was, in the long run, I think it would save us money and better communication between the departments. So we think it's a good thing to do. Good thing. I, if I recall the request is for $11,000. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. okay. And, you know, and the details of the request all showed how careful they were in determining the best course forward. Okay, great. So I will accept this uh, recommendation as a motion. Is there a second here to um, approve this? I'll second. Okay, thanks, Tara. All right, is there any discussion here at the select board? All right. Is there any discussion in the room? Any discussion online? Actually, I do have something to say or yeah, ask. Okay. So um, I don't have it pulled up in front of me, but I know that it was for one radio and then batteries as well, right? Oh, yeah. It was two radios. Yes. Okay, two so radios. The plan is that they're going to be purchasing throughout the next number of years a full complement of radios, but the first request is to start them out. The two. Okay. Perfect. And so with the batteries, do they just need to, if we're getting new batteries, where it's probably for the old, the radios we already have? I see. What do you mean? They don't, I don't think they yeah. have any digital radios now in handy. Okay. They have phones and they're okay. transitioning. Okay. They're planning to transition. So it's just backup batteries, satellite for the phones. phones we're getting. Yeah. For the radios, yeah. yeah. The radios are, okay. they're sold with batteries. And the, it's a package price. Okay. Okay. I guess my I was just I didn't know if there was extra batteries and like how long the batteries lasted. You just plug them in and they're good. Or I was I just wanted to know about the batteries. It says spare batteries in their request. Okay. Uh, so they must be probably sounds like from the what I'm backup. reading here that well, they that might makes get. sense if there's no power. Yeah. Yeah. Plus backup. So when you're using a battery, you have a spare to charge. Or does it not charge? Yeah, they charge. Yeah, they charge. charge. So then that would mean that the phone, or, or that they would always be oh, able to, to be running because you have a backup battery. Okay. Tara, right. Dan Engel just joined us. If you want to ask him, I would have, I would have been more prepared if I had it in front of me. <laughs> just. <laughs> It was, it was going off memory. No, I'm good. I just it's, I was it's just, in a folder. I believe, yeah. Today's folder. Yeah, I could just hand it to I you if you wanted to see it. It's okay. I understand. I understand that you'll be able to have a backup battery for it, which makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. So you just want to confirm that to make sure that it's a, a thorough system that doesn't have any pitfalls. Yeah, and kind of like how how that how they ran. Okay. But I think I'm good. All right. Okay, let's take a vote. All in favor of this, uh, uh, approving this request, say aye. 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 Uh, I hear no abstentions. Are there any um, nays? Okay. Thank you, that passes. All right, we will move on now to new business. And at this moment, we'll, uh, we'll hear from the Guilford, uh, the Guilford Volunteer Fire Department again. Back in the hot seat. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm here to present our fiscal year 25 budget. Mm -hmm. I think you all have received a copy of that. Um, so our final request is for the sum of $268,000, $268,550. This is a 3.76% increase from last year. 
a total of $10,100 more than last year. Um, but I would like to note that our total expenses have actually gone down from last year. And the reason why our request has gone up, despite our expenses going down, is that you may recall last year the fire department put in $15,000 worth of our own um, money from our prior year budgets. Um, we had some money that was given to us and some bequests and some um, donations that we decided would be best used to offset the tax increase last year. Um, and so that was a $15,000, which we had said at the time would only be a one-time thing that we would be able to do. Um, so without that additional 15000 that's why the request is going up. We were able to offset some of that, um, about almost $5,000 of that, by reducing expenses, um, primarily in two areas. One of those areas was in medical and EMT expenses. So we've noticed that some of our um, medical expenses specifically related to COVID have gone down significantly. Um, we used to you know, dress out in full garb from head to toe and, and we're no longer having to do that um, as an example. So that line item has gone down as well as our building fund. So we have an O&M building fund and as I know you all know, we also have a capital building fund. And we realized that because we have a good substantial capital building fund that the town is funding each year, we didn't seem to think we needed as much of a O&M budget line item, so we've reduced that also. Um, so we've reduced our expenses by $4,900, which helps offset the um, increase and puts us again at an increase of about $10,000 and 3.76% from last year. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you to jump back for just a second. Sure. The piece of paper we're looking at has a different number for the for the proposed budget. Can you say what your number is? Uh, your proposed number is? Yeah, I have two sixty-eight five fifty. Oh, I see. For the appropriation, I get it. Okay, there it is. Okay, thank you. I no, we okay. don't have a different number. Okay, uh, great. <laughs> you good. Worried me for a Yeah, minute. yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, I, looked okay. at the, I looked at the larger number. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. so, so to speak to that, though, what I think you were looking at is our town appropriation is the majority of our income, but we also report income from um, fundraising and donations. So our total projected income is $282,050, yeah. which may okay. have been what you were looking at. Yep. Yeah, very clear. Good. Beth, can you um, describe what debt service is? Yeah, that's for our truck. So a couple years ago, 2019, um, and I wish somebody else could back me up, but I think it was 2019 that we bought our pumper truck, um, and that's what our debt is on. So um, we have equal payments every uh, quarter. We pay those quarterly. Yeah. And, and how, that was long, a, how long is the debt? In space? I think it's a five-year uh -huh. um, note. And where are you at this moment? So 2019. So, so I think we've done. got yeah. I think we've got one more year after okay. this. Okay. And then um, that will. Do you expect that that forty-six thousand dollar figure that would drop out of the budget? So what what we would like to do is to continue to fund our truck fund with that mm -hmm. because we anticipate you know our trucks kind of rotate through. We've got our tankers and our pumpers, our engines, um, and so we just did our um, pumper truck. So I'm not sure which one. I can't speak to which one would be up next, but they run. You know, I think this one was upwards of 500000 So if we can put this money into that truck fund until the time that we're ready to buy our new one, I think that would be the most financially savvy decision. Yeah. yeah. So then it, the funds wouldn't be listed under debt service. It would just be equipment sinking funders. Yeah, so if you look um, towards the very bottom of the budget, you'll actually see that we're already putting 36000 into a truck fund in addition oh, yes. to the, the note that we're paying. Um, so I would expect that it would just increase that line item. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, um, yes, yep, it's right a couple lines up from the bottom. So it would be like $82,000 for a truck that isn't needed yet. Not yet, yep. Yep, so it would go into that sinking fund. Um, and 
I wish I had the balances. We report out the balances at town meeting of what those sinking funds are, um, mm -hmm. and I can also send them to you anytime. Mm -hmm. I don't have them on the top of my head. <coughs> Ideally, we it would be great if we were fully funded and we didn't have to carry a note. Mm -hmm. um, that's always the goal. Yeah. So, the, so the idea of, of having an outlay fund is is to try to get to that. Point. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. And to space the trucks out over time, so that by the time we're finished paying one off, we've now funded <clears throat> um, enough for the next one. So we weren't able to buy this last one outright, um, but I think. The hope is that we'll be pretty close. I know the cost of the trucks has also gone up significantly over the last couple of years, but as close as we can get. Well, can I ask you a question about when you when you bought the truck that caused you uh, that put you into debt service? Mm -hmm. uh, was is that something that you had to make an appeal to the select board about? I, I don't know the, how that uh, works. So that was before my before time. You, I don't recall mm -hmm. if how how does that work? Do you remember? Then, oh, right. Um. Okay, well, we can get back to I'll yeah, find just like out. an answer to that. I'm just sure. curious, not only because of the fire department, but just generally how, yeah, this, how, how the finances works. are moving through and things like that. Right. So, yeah. I'll find out how that works in London. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. That'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Um, any other questions here? So for fundraising, what mm -hmm. are your fund fundraisers? So our largest fundraiser, like financially, is actually the Welcome Center, which we split with the um, trustee or the um, auxiliary. So they also contribute to that. That's actually our largest money maker um, because there's not much expense to it. We get donations when we buy things and we sell coffee and cookies. Um, the other ones, we have the Guilford Fair um, with the chicken barbecue. Um, historically, we've had the Sugar on Snow, which unfortunately, because of COVID, we haven't had the last few years. Although we did have an open house this year where we served Sugar on Snow and we collected donations, and that was okay. I mean, that did okay. Mm -hmm. um, those fundraisers don't generally bring in a ton of money. It's more of a public relations um, community event rather than fundraising. Um, we actually generate most of our income besides the town appropriation through donations. Um, we get a lot of memorial donations um, and then just generous community mm -hmm. members making um, annual donations. So with the Welcome Center, is that a big sale? It is, yes. Is it just one year? Yes, okay. just over, but it's over Columbus Day okay. or Indigenous Peoples Day mm -hmm. weekend. Um, and so that brings in a lot of traffic through the Welcome right. Center that particular weekend. Right. So we're lucky to have that. Um, that do you, get, do you have a walk on that every year? Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, well, that's, that's impressive. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. Most nonprofits have to sort of give, get whichever weekend. Yeah, right. I don't know how they've secured it, um, uh -huh. but that's our day. Wow, wow. <laughs> that's fabulous. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any further questions? Pat Hain on Zoom has asked, who's speaking? Oh. Oh, Beth Bristol. I'm the treasurer of the Guilford Volunteer Fire Department. Thanks. I should my fault for that. That's okay. Asking you. I yeah. should have introduced. Yeah. Um, okay. So thank you. There we there's no vote here or anything. We're just accepting this, okay. and we'll go and go into the budget process, and we'll talk about it a little bit more tonight, and then we go forward. Thank you. I'm very so grateful. Oh, Steve. What's a, a what's a new pumper tanker cost? I don't know. I wish Jared was here. He's working. Probably, <laughs> so I'm you're probably looking at about six hundred grand. Yeah. Right, so you know, when you're selling brownies and getting donations. Yeah. You're looking at six hundred thousand yeah. dollars. You're putting thirty-six thousand dollars. Which is expensive brownies. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I think that our note for this pumper was in the five hundred thousand, like over five hundred. But I know the prices have gone up because Jared has said. It's going to be a shocker when we go to order the next one because it's gone up so much. So. And is, is yeah. there trade-in possible? Do you know? Yeah, yeah, I, so. yeah. Huh? We, we usually sell it sell to it. another uh, I see. department. I see. Yeah. So you will, you'll see some uh, yeah. lowering of cost that way. Yeah. All right. Well, I think all of us are really grateful and humbled by the work of our fire department, mm -hmm. really. Absolutely. All right, so then we move ahead to a FEMA update. Steve, have you back again? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Sorry, keep popping out your yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, All right, take people different hats, right? <laughs> All right, so I've written up my presentation again so we don't ramble away. So tonight, it's a, uh, it's a uh, topic near and dear to everybody's heart, the National Flood Insurance Program. <laughs> Everybody wants to hear a lot of this. I figured this would probably take an hour, hour and a half or something. <laughs> All right, so why am I here again? Uh, Steve Lemke, I'm the floodplain administrator. And I've been doing that for a number of years in town. And as the floodplain administrator, I'm responsible uh, to uh, working with FEMA and the select board to manage our current flood uh, uh, special hazard area and our relationship with FEMA and the uh, flood insurance program. So a little background for the folks at home. Uh, for, dec for decades, flood insurance from private insurance companies was either not offered at all or it was available and the rates were unaffordable. To help with this problem, problem Congress in 1968 <coughs> began the National Flood Insurance Program. It was designed to provide a source of flood insurance, partially funded by the federal government, for people whose homes and businesses were located in areas called special flood hazard areas. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, establishes and maps special flood hazard areas for every town in the U.S. and shows these maps on maps entitled Flood Insurance Rate Maps. And the town has multiple copies of these. They're called firms. Um, and Guilford is broken down into four different sections. So there's a different map for each of the sections. But if you were to open this up, you get something slightly smaller than the ones on the wall here. But it shows things like Weatherhead Hollow and the special flood areas, uh, you know, Keats Brook, uh, you know, Green River. And it maps all the things that FEMA believes are these special flood hazard areas, and they've done the mapping, so they believe in it, and that's what they say they are. Um, to get the discounted insurance, uh, com communities must choose to participate in the program. And to participate in the NFIP, a community must regulate all new development and high-risk special flood hazard areas to ensure that new development is safe from flood damage and pass a bylaw stating that the town is committed uh, to following the FEMA guidelines and regulations. And back in 1988, uh, the town at that point uh, passed a bylaw. The maps were redone in 2007, and it's, this is it. It's a 10-page bylaw. This is our government at work, you know, in its finest. Uh, every, but uh, if you want anything to know about what you can and can't do in the special flood hazard areas, this is what, you, this is what people go by. And if there are questions, then they call, they call me and I and somebody else go out and we look at their property and so forth. Um, Guilford initially joined the NFIP in 1988 and passed a bylaw stating that the town would abide by the FEMA rules and regulations. Nearly 90% of communities in Vermont participate in the NFIP. Without participating, the people who who are grandfathered into it, who were part of, the, who live in special flood hazard areas prior to any of this mapping being done in 1968 or whatever it was, are grandfathered into that. But they still need insurance if they have a mortgage on the house or anything. So they, so those people without, if anybody's purchased flood insurance here, you know, it can be $13,000, $20,000 a year. The NFIP helps mitigate some of those costs. So that's the point. And, but without Guilford saying we want to help uh, reduce these costs, there would be no reduction. The risk of flooding and the resulting cost of insurance is based on the FEMA-produced maps called flood insurance rate maps or firms. Uh, at various intervals, FEMA undertakes the process of updating the flood insurance rate maps. At the conclusion of their updating efforts, FEMA publishes the new maps and requires that participating towns accept the changes and issue a new bylaw referencing the new maps. So in 1988, they came to us and said, here are the maps. You want in or you want out? We said in, so they said, we'll abide by those maps. 2007, they said, we're updating this. You want in or out? We said in, so we said, okay, you have to abide by the 2007 maps. So in 2020, no, 2018, five years ago, I went to the first meeting that they, that FEMA uh, published to say, we're going to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, and so for five years, They've been working on updating the existing maps. And they, they do it in different ways. Uh, in some areas that are the most uh, flood prone, they send people out you know, with clipboards and uh, green eye shades to map things on, on site and things. Others like Guilford, which is zone A, which is the least flood uh, prone areas, 
um, they just do it by mapping. But they used to do it uh, by mapping with uh, GPS, and now they do it with LIDAR. And the difference between doing it with LIDAR, which is this, you know, aerial views, is that the, the amount of difference is that they do it with the GPS, it was every nine meet, every three meters of topographic uh, things. Now it's every half foot. So it's how, you know, they can get even finer with that if they have to. So they're redoing our maps with this half foot to a foot gradient instead of three meters. And that will, and what that means is that if you have a, if you have a, a waterway that runs like this, and you do it with the GPS, it says, okay, here it is. It's pretty straightforward. This is the way we do it. We're doing it. But now you do it with a half foot. Some people who were in are now out. Some people who are out could potentially be in, or part of their garage could potentially be in. So what FEMA's done now is they, they started having these meetings, and I went with maps and things, and I said, these are the areas that are flood prone in the, in the town. It'd be nice if we could do something more specific here. And basically, when I got done with the meeting, they sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, go take a pill, you're in zone A. Uh, <laughs> what do you want from us? You know, so like, we got, you know, we got people who are getting flood prone from you know, mm -hmm. flood surge you know, or okay. from storm surge. So at the conclusion of the current update and the issuance of the new maps, towns wishing to remain in the National Flood Insurance Program will again be required to issue a new bylaw accepting the new maps and reaffirming their role in regulating development in the special flood hazard areas. Zan and I received an email that this is just one of four packages that was in the email. Um, and thank goodness for Eric. I don't know that you even mentioned that I bugged you incessantly to <laughs> no, run, <laughs> run these off and, and color in the maps and everything else. But this is the first flood insurance study uh, preview of what's coming up. And I have to say you know, that I've gone through all of these four things. I don't believe we're going to have a lot of big changes in Guilford just because we don't have that many tricky waterways, we don't have that many you know, uh, coastal flooding areas that need to be reconsidered and things. Um, we still have to follow the rules, but you have to do that anyway. You know? So I would say that coming up that we'll, we'll look at this, the, next, the timing for all of this is that uh, we're in a 30-day review period right now from what John and I received and, and Eric to help me with. Um, but in looking at it again, nothing seems to be major. So there were no major comments like you spelled Keats Brook wrong or something like that. The next timing will be a 90 day uh, uh, comment period, which will be some public, some FEMA. There will be a, a, a group meeting of towns with a FEMA representative to answer questions uh, that we have as a result of this. Then there will be more time for reconsideration. My anticipation is that this will go into effect 10 months from now. By the time the maps get issued and the bylaw is written and everything else happens, we'll probably be um, probably a reasonable estimate of 10 months on a project that started five years ago. Wow. So next October, the select board might be asked to do another one of these bylaw right. changes. Right. And basically, it'll be the same, the same thing. Just it's because the rules and regulations haven't changed. It's just the geographic uh, areas might change. But what applies to those geographic areas is exactly the same. Steve, thank you. I mean, it's remarkable uh, that th there's this amount of information and uh, concentration required to get through this one issue right. in our community. And you thank you for give us a little cross-eyed reading it, but <laughs> exactly. after you've read enough of yeah. it, it's the same. But it's the same thing, just you know, presented in a different way. So. Are there any questions for Steve? Well, it's uh, yes. it's not. Yeah, I mean. When you think about what flooding has meant to our state, yes. uh, one, I think we're geographically lucky, and also we're lucky because of the foresightful care that our highway department does, I think, to make the best of the lay of the land that we have. But what will we need to do in response to this? We'll have to pass another bylaw, which is a, a, a kind of continuation of the 1988 one. It will be, for all intents and purposes, a photocopy of that signed by all of you instead of uh, Dick Clark, Ann Ryder, and, and Dennis Franklin. You okay. know? Um, I assume that's what will happen. Now, I may, I may be surprised. I talked with the... There, one thing about FEMA, they're really responsive. You call 
call Boston slash Cambridge, they actually answered the phone. Mm -hmm. the guy, and I was stunned. I was waiting for him to you know, say, call me back. And it was a real person. So I said to him, this is my assessment, having looked at this, that there's very little changes that will occur here. Um, do you agree with that assessment? And he said, basically, he said, but the devil will be in the details mm -hmm. when you start actually putting the houses that are in the special flood hazard area now up against the actual new maps. Uh, so I think our work, my work, some combination of us work will end up being once the maps are released and final, then we start looking at uh, who's in and who's out and who's planning. So but, then, but in a town with no building permits, you know, the only way I know somebody's building a special flood hazard area is if I drive by and see the lumber pile. Right. And I'm just saying, I'm not going to argue for building permits, but if somebody builds something in a town with no building permit in the special flood hazard area, they get to take it down. Uh -huh. Okay, This isn't like, oh, well, sorry, um, you didn't ask, so it's okay to build it. That's not how this works. I see. And one last thing about the, the flood insurance side of it is that if you have a if you have a mortgage on a house that's in a special flood hazard area um, and it's backed by a, by a bank, that's uh, you know all to do, protected to two hundred fifty thousand dollars by FCID or whatever that is. That's federally uh, fund. That's federal funds, and you don't get that mortgage unless you do these things. So that's why people, um, you know, a cash transaction. That's a different deal. You pay your money, take your chances. Don't want insurance and anything else. You can put it there, but you can't wow. build it there. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So there's some communication that's going to be required yeah. as we move through the steps. Yeah. I don't think changes. dramatic, but in some, yeah. I think it's more individual okay. that will be just to town wide. Yep. And you okay. might need some staff support at that point. Well, sitting down at the end of the table, so I appreciate <laughs> yeah. Erica's work. Yeah. But what you said, um, Miranda, is so true because Danny and company prevent the flood. You know, it's one thing to say this is what happens when you flood and there's buyouts. I mean, John Broker Campbell is <coughs> the Southeast Regional. Uh, the floodplain administrator and the Wyndham Regional Commission person and I went to a house here in, in Guilford to talk about a buyout um, <clears throat> of the property because of where they were located. And it's one of the few places that can't have mitigated flooding because right. of, of their location. You know, it's sort of like sitting at the end of the fire hose, you know, where you're going right. to get wet. Uh, but, but the work that Danny does with culverts and everything else can't be emphasized enough mm -hmm. uh, to the because prevention is 99% of the yeah. good result of this. So. Okay. Thank you. Keep us so the loop. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, All right. Thank you. <laughs> We'll move ahead, folks, to the next item on the agenda, which I just want to speak very quickly about the budget process that we're in, involved now. Um, just mostly so folks can hear this uh, in the community. We have our final, we assume, our final budget meeting this Thursday. Uh, if those meetings are open to the public, budget workshop open to the public. After that process is done, the, the staff will put together uh, of the budget for us as a select board to see as a package and, and understand and we'll review it uh, and then make a recommendation that it be turned into essentially an article on the town uh, for the town meeting. Uh, at the same time, there's another process that happens where we, we send the budget forward to the town auditors who um, their job is I would call it largely proofreading uh, to make sure that, that everything's in good order and that things uh, appear correctly in the town uh, report. Um, then, there, then everyone gets a copy of the town report, the warning for the meeting, and uh, then we have the large community discussion about the budget, uh, such as it can be, uh, and then we have, we'll talk about how that will work here in, a, in just a minute, and then the, the town votes for the budget. So that's the process from now through March, and there are many inside steps there. But I just want to let everybody know that we're in the we're in the throes of this now, and uh, this is what's happening as we go forward. Any questions? Fair enough. Okay. Good. Let's move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, this is the question: Shall the town use the Australian ballot for the this town meeting, the one in March 2024, per COVID Act? Uh, it's uh, it's per COVID, <laughs> not per COVID Act, but per COVID, and the Act uh, it, at the state is Act One H forty two, which allows it was adopted in January of this year and allows for uh, 
towns to continue with the COVID practice of uh, not conducting a public town meeting, but doing all of um, uh, doing all of its work by a straddling ballot. So all the articles appear in, in the voting booth rather than in, uh, in, in the, on the floor. Um, the reason we need to discuss this this evening and see if we can get to a determination about what we'd like to do is because there are a number of issues coming forward that impinge upon and, and, and what we decide to do will make a difference about some things that are coming forward. So during COVID, we had, uh, we had two meetings, I think, to, that were canceled because of COVID and we conducted everything with the Australian ballot. If we have the Australian ballot method, we are required, each town is required then to have an informational meeting prior so that people can uh, at least hear the articles and can hear uh, and can, can uh, talk about them. The, the uh, meeting, those meetings don't work like a town meeting. There isn't as much back and forth discussion traditionally. It's more an informational meeting than it is a, a, a real discussion about uh, with motions and all that kind of thing. No decisions are made at the informational meeting. So um, uh, that's, what, that's a practice that we had. It would be that kind of practice. We would have, it would be by Zoom probably, and we would, you know, we would allow people to engage in the process as much as we possibly could. Um, but it would mean that um, we would not have a meeting on March what, 4th? 5th. 5th, March 5th. And that uh, all of the articles uh, this year would be voted uh, by in, uh, in the voting booth, or you know, um, by prior. Uh, there are many options for voting at this point. If if we have a town meeting, all of those articles would be voted on on the floor, and cannot be voted in the voting booth. So it's a choice we're making about how the voting goes. Two things I see, how, we, how the community can discuss and, and, and uh, articulate <clears throat> points of view, and how the, the community can vote. That's the decision we, we need to make. So this, this addresses the fact that there's a large percentage of people that can't make it to town meeting? As far as being able to vote for articles, yes, that's correct. They will be able to vote for um, uh, office holders. That is already done by Australia. We do that traditionally right. in Guilford. So it's issues of budget and issues of, what's the name of that other one? Public. Public. Um, uh, articles. Public. So public there are there, public questions. Those are the two categories of questions. I will bring up one more point for us to consider. We know or we believe there's one, there's one issue that's coming forward that's being suggested to us to become an article that cannot be voted by our, by our Australian ballot. It has to be voted on the floor. That's by statute. So if we choose to, and it's an article about whether or not we should use Australian ballot in the future, so if we choose to go with Australian ballot this year, we are essentially making it impossible to vote for that for that other for that idea. It can't be voted. It has to be voted on the floor by statute. So it's complicated. And also, so even though there are people that do not make it to town meeting for whatever reason, um, a, a large percentage is not showing up and voting. Um, going to say even though that is happening um what were you just saying well there's the, there's a vote that we're not going to be able to take right yeah uh for we would not be able to take a vote uh on an article about the australian ballot that okay. question has to happen on the floor i got it so when <coughs> will people be able to to be, voice their opinions like in town meeting when when an article comes up and someone doesn't agree with it and wants to talk about it, that can't happen if we go all Australian ballot. Uh, correct, uh, except that probably during the informational meeting. Although you just said that it's not 
an interactive meeting. Well, it's, it's not interactive in the sense that we're not ultimately going to vote. Okay. There, and I don't. We haven't, we haven't had in the past. They've been called informational meetings. I don't actually know what the possibilities are for these meetings. Whether we can open it up and have open debate and all that kind of thing. I think there are public hearings. There are public hearings, Especially so there, there would probably be possibility. So there would be. It would be a new a new way for us to go. Yeah. I I, I don't like eliminating mm -hmm. the idea of people coming together and being able to talk and and right. review their opinions and <coughs> and have have the floor. I don't. Right. I think that eliminates something that is traditional and unnecessary. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Are there other thoughts around all of this? Well, uh, yeah, I I agree with Tara. I guess is the short version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm inclined to uh, the, the notion of, the, of our community being able to face each other and talk about issues seems very important. However, that works, whether that's in the town meeting or whether it's at this right. informational meeting. So why can't you do a little bit of both though? That's what I can't understand. Well, we uh, we cannot have, we can't, it would be ideal if we could vote, if people could vote on the floor and vote the articles, and you can't do that. That It's one or the other, as I understand it. Well, right now we have the elected positions on Australian ballot, but we have budget issues and public questions on the floor. That's the way, so... So, yeah, we could, if we have the informational meeting, and we'll we have, have the informational we will have it any, we will have it anyway, whether we have an Australian ballot or not, we're going to have an, an informational meeting. What that informational meeting looks and feels like, what kind of discussion we're able to have, and what kinds of, how, we, how that gets moderated, and all of that, I'm not entirely clear about that yet. But that would be the space. It basically, Guilford would be moving its kind of that feel to another moment, which would not include everyone. It's just the difference is that everyone would be able to vote on all the articles, perhaps not having heard the public discussion, right? Or perhaps not even availing themselves of any public discussion. But if you do not show up to the town meeting and we are not Australian ballot, you do not get to vote on everything. Exactly. That's correct. So, as I recall, imperfectly, and maybe Don McLean can help, you know, during COVID, we had sort of a collaborative information meeting where the Broadbrook Range has traditionally had pre town meeting and we kind of piggyback that together with the select board informational meeting and there was um there was a certain amount of give and take really it was um information offered in the most clear way that we could and i believe that there was some give and take in addition to that, and I think it was very well attended. So that was a good news part of it. But I still feel as if there's no substitute for coming together. And when, as a sidebar to this, um, in some reading that's come across my computer about trying to increase attendance by moving to a date, you know, a, a Saturday when people aren't working, that that hasn't proven, um, according to what I was just reading, to increase uh, attendance dramatically. So, you know, and barring having town meeting day be a Vermont holiday, you know, I think all we can do is try to uh, welcome our engaged public and people can do the best they can to participate in the broad range of ways we hope they are able. Miranda Don says, yes, the Grange's pre-town meeting in the last couple of years has doubled as the select board's informational meeting. 
Yeah, I will say that uh, I will say that the select board, if we uh, choose under COVID uh, restrictions, so for this year using COVID restrictions, if we go by Australian ballot, it's the select board is required to have this informational meeting. So it's been a wonderful tradition that the Grange has done. We want to continue partnering with them, but it won't be the Grange's meeting. We're required by, as I understand it, by the by the strictures of the COVID regulations uh, to have the meeting. And so um, uh, that may, may begin to change it a little bit. But yeah, thank you. So get to that. Just say, so. Uh, there are other considerations here. The only thing I got to say is that the, with the Australian vet, some people who can't make, they pay their taxes. They should have the right to vote on issues where mm -hmm. if they can't make it to a meeting. Yeah. I, I sympathize with people that can't make it due to work yeah. um, reasons. Um, I went from a very flexible work schedule to a situation where now I probably have to take a vacation day to participate. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm considering the Australian idea, but I don't think this is the year to do it, just mm -hmm. given the, uh, the particular uh, Issues. Issue that we have mm -hmm. before us here. Well, this year, it, this is just the one issue that might needs to be voted from the floor that we know about. There might be others that we don't. Mm -hmm. We we yeah, just have yeah. we just don't know about yet. This is a really flexible time, um, and um, it it strikes me that if more and more towns move to this model, like apparently Marlboro uses this model, if more and more towns use this model, I would imagine the state will have to give some leeway in how things are voted on and not have these strictures about what can be voted from the floor and whatnot, because it really will start to limit how you can get work done then. And I imagine we start to see some changes in the other direction. I do, don't know. Do you think that we could, I know that there's a lot of work that the town does and everybody in the office does, but what about doing a vote, like a survey monkey vote and asking a hundred, taking a hundred answers and asking who would want it, um, just a yes or no simple, or would you want it, or would you want it to move to Saturday? Because the statistics that Brenda read are that even moving to Saturday, there wasn't an increase in participation, but there wasn't a decrease. So you might be, you might be targeting a whole new group of people that can go on Saturday. <laughs> You'd be getting a different set of yeah, voters. Is you what might. You get, yeah, you And then you would probably be getting your, you'd be opening it up to a different set, but also get your diehards that are going to be there no matter what. Yeah. Um, the, the, the question of whether or not we're going to go to Australian ballot, if we were to hold a town meeting, your idea of a quiz, uh, you know, a, a survey to the community is what's actually going to happen at town meeting, probably, because the town's going to be asked, do we want to do this? And the, then on the floor, the people that are there will make the decision. That's different than putting something out to the entire community to find out. Isn't that a little um, prejudice that people that are there probably would yeah, prefer? Yeah, it is. And the, but the other issue is it's, it's the select board's job to figure out whether or not it wants, to, the select board makes the decision. Now, granted, we can choose how we make the decision. We can get information out of what we like to make our decision. So that's worth considering. There is the pressure of time here. We have to get this done and set in a certain way because we have, if we're gonna do a striking ballot, that's gonna change the town clerk's job quite a bit because suddenly it's a much different election that she'll be running than if she's uh, running it, uh, running uh, only public officers, um, and suddenly it's a different, a different kind of situation. We voted at our last meeting not to mail a ballot to every town because it would probably be confusing if there's also a ballot that people are voting on, and and we may change that now if we decide to go with the Australian ballot. So things, you know, there's a lot of things that are in flux here. And where is this coming from? You know, like Th this. This is just a. This is just an option for us. Uh, that's given to every town. It's something for us to consider. Okay. If we do nothing, so which we got is, something from the state saying, "Do you want to change?" It's it's a it's a state law that allows us to do this. Okay. And if we do nothing, we go forward with the town meeting. 
It's just that we, we, we can, it's not coming from our community. Uh, uh, it, 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 I mean, there's definitely feelings in the community that I've heard already, but, but it's not, uh, the, this particular issue is not coming from the community. Okay. It's a state, it's a state uh, statute possibility. Act, it's an act. It was passed in January of this year and it's still effective for next year's time. Okay, I'm going to open it up just a little bit so we can hear from a couple of folks in the community. Uh, let's go with Sheila first and then Rick. Thank you. So I just wanted to say that um, when we have the information, the pre-town meeting, mm -hmm. there's a much smaller group of people that actually make it to town meeting. And so you'd be looking at a smaller group of people who would be asking and getting information at an information hearing or a pre-town meeting or a public hearing than you do at town meeting, because there's probably 250 or so people that go to town meeting, which would be nice to see 700 people on a Saturday, but I, I think by having an Australian ballot and only having informational meeting, it's, it's, it's even limiting. It's, it's, it's even decreasing the engagement of town yeah, residents. I, I, think yeah, I think there's two things that are being conflated here. <coughs> One is that the state saying you can go to Australian ballot because of COVID, you know, it's a public health, you know, issue. In 2020, you know, we had a town meeting just as COVID was arriving, and we were very lucky. The same thing with sugar on snow. That was in March, and in March, you know, you know, the what hit the fan, you know, in terms of COVID. Um, so, so I think you know that that's really what the state is asking for now. Do you want to go to Australian ballot in order to protect your citizens from COVID? Uh, then there's the other issue, you know. In the future, do we want to change our way of voting? And that's a whole different issue. Uh, and that, yeah, as you say, that the select board can't decide that. You know, you can decide this year because of the COVID Act, but uh, for for to change the way the town votes, it's got to be done at, at town meeting from the floor. Yes. And, and then, uh, Absolutely. Um, and and I, I would also just say there's another option for change changing the time, which is to go to a, a Tuesday night, which is what Vernon does. And Vernon gets a pretty good turnout. Uh, I was there last year, and they, they get a pretty good turnout uh, having an evening meeting. Uh, what the numbers are, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Right. Steve? Well, here's another suggestion. Would it be possible to have the pre meeting the way we always do it at the pre meeting? But then on the day that's March 4th or 5th, whatever it's supposed to be, have basically a town meeting where people get together and discuss the issues, but don't vote from the floor. In other words, if the conversation comes up about the Green River Village Preservation Trust and its exemption, and I'm there and somebody has a question, just like the regular town meeting, I can stand up and plead my case or talk about this or talk about FEMA or something else in a discussion. The only thing that's missing at that point is when Rick says, what's your pleasure? Let's call the question. So what happens is people get the information, they get the camaraderie, they get the rest of it, and before they leave, they go home. You know, I mean that's that's one different way of looking at it. So you don't give up, you don't give up the camaraderie, you don't give up the information, uh, but you allow people to vote. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I understand it correctly, in order to vote Australian ballot, you have to get up off the couch, drive to the the ballot, the voting place, and and vote. Or you can have the vote. You can request a vote be mailed to your yes, house. Yes, but it's but you you have to yeah you have to not, take the initiative. Yeah, you don't just yeah. like push a button from home. There's right. still something that people have to interact. Correct. You know, I think we can't remember how many people vote in this town, but maybe five hundred. Well, the last, the last few years, the uh, town meeting town meeting has about two hundred people who vote, as I understand historically. I think right, but I'm saying if the who come to the town meeting and vote. But yeah. for select board or anything else, how many people? vote? Oh, the last, the last few years, because of 750 or so. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a significant yeah. a number. So that would be a that would be a suggestion if somebody feels they have to change is to keep the meetings the same, have the same, have the two town meeting as informational and one on one discussion and group on one discussions and so forth, but let the voting be for the rest of the day. Okay. Um, All of you is just okay. Well, there's a 
a book co-authored by an emeritus UBM professor, Frank Bryan, called All in Favor, which is a discussion of this issue. I believe the Guilford Library has copies. <laughs> Some homework for us all. <laughs> OK, good. Uh, so, uh, oh, so oh, sorry, can I? Yes. Um, I think I agree with Sheila in, talk, in, in talking about, um, you know, if you just have the pre-sound meeting or the informational meeting, whatever it's called, that you don't really reach as many people. And, um, and, and I also think that a lot of these motions that have to be voted on, it's so hard um, to sort of vote on them without asking questions and without right. discussing it, yeah. because it, it just involves a whole lot of things. So I know that Steve's idea tries to remedy that, but I just don't understand the timing issue of how that would work. You know, if it's not if you're not going to be voting on it, how many people would would come at an appropriate time to hear the discussion and to participate yeah. in the discussion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that would be very unwieldy. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, I had something I wanted to add too because on one hand having the meeting in the evening might be good for one cohort, but then there are increasing number of, uh, of residents who don't drive at night anymore. So unless they had uh, sort of carpools. Or you know. babysitters. Well, right. I mean, child care at our town meeting has been um, a sore topic. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, for a while. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, I'll just weigh in. Um, I think the comments sort of illustrate why we value town meeting. Mm -hmm. That what seemed pretty straightforward, black and white, you know, do we want to go Australian ballot and increase, potentially increase turnout? We've really woven through the issue so that it's more complicated um, and that's because of this discussion that we've had and people weighing in so I think it demonstrates the value of that collective coming together and then the other question I would have about turnout is you know is that difference of 200 versus 750 is that in a March non know statewide election mm -hmm. it's not really comparable if we're comparing a November election mm -hmm. when there are multiple you know sort of statewide things and it's Australia mm -hmm. would we really increase the number of participants in March for the budget yeah I, I, I will say that um, during COVID the and and people needing to vote, uh, the numbers rose, no matter what the election was compared to our town meeting. So um, I think that I, you know, not every, not every vote has been, not every election has been a, a significant one, but still numbers of folks have come. Sheila, may we move on? So I, just, I just think that at town meeting, on town meeting day, maybe 700 people come through the door to vote, maybe 250 or so stay for a town meeting. I think that's what you were referring to yeah, before. I think that's right, yeah. Um, so the point that I've heard in this discussion that strikes me the most is I think I, I'm inclined to look at this, uh, this question, as Rick suggested, is this a question of safety for our public? And I think if that's the case, then I think we want to do Australian ballot. Uh, but it occurs to me that we're, if we're, if we're not as concerned about our public safety, I mean, of course we're concerned, but if we're not concerned about the detriments to our public in March, then we're already talking about the next question, which is actually the town's question and really not our question uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. it, it, maybe that's sort of kicking it down the road, but it's a way for me to see a way through this that I think for this year, um, we don't have a, a COVID reason to move to change the format. And if, if a community felt that that was a concern, and there are communities where I think where people are more concerned about these issues than perhaps we are at this moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that many elderly, disabled, or immunocompromised people are not going to come out anyway. 
um, and with COVID still looming, probably would not. Is that do you is that enough or is that strong enough statement that you feel like we should uh, change the format this year? I don't. Okay. All right. I don't. You think so? We should go ahead with town meeting in your mind. Okay. Um, I will move then that we uh, that we continue with the plan to have a town meeting on March fifth. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Thank you, Michael. All right. We have enough discussion. Um, oh, Don has a different title, perhaps. <laughs> we'll check that out. All right. Um, is there any further discussion at the select board? Okay, so let's vote then. All in favor of, of moving forward with a March 5th town meeting public, um, say aye. 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 Thank you, folks. It's a tricky discussion. Um, One day. Huh? One day. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't finish with that. I thought I saw you say no. So there's an A. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you, Rest Thank you, sir. Any abstentions? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Then I want to just talk through the next item on the agenda, which is that there's a proposal that's been handed to uh, us um, about the idea of having a town, uh, the town vote on whether we should proceed with Australian ballot going forward. Uh, I want to just discuss it this evening and let you know that uh, uh, this, this came from our town clerk, um, uh, and she's acting in the role, I think she, uh, she, when I talk with her, she's not, you know, the, the role of being town clerk and being a citizen, she has to weigh that. I, I suggested to her that if she's certain that she wants the language to be, the language of this article to be as she would hope it would be, uh, and that, that the, probably the stronger way for her to assure that it becomes the, the article that she hopes is to go get the 88 signatures and the petition that she that would be required to put a, it's a petitioned article then. Um, and so she heard that. Uh, because the, if she recommends a, 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 it to the select board, we have the option of carrying it forward or not, but that's, but, but, but that's not, uh, or some version of it. So that's something for us to consider as we go forward. So I just want to say all of that. I don't think we we don't have to make a decision on it tonight. We have the we we've all we've all read the uh, it's in our packet what the language looks like, and then uh, we will uh, uh, I'll check with Danielle once again and see you know it could be another member of the community who might want to step up with the signatures and make it into a petition if that's the road that 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 a particular group of people wants to go or not, that's fine. Uh, if, if, it, if, they, if they choose not to go that way, then I think this stands and at, at a future meeting we will need to discern what to do with that as far as a, an article goes for us. Is there a timeline? Yes. Uh, one way or the other for yeah. Danielle either to say yes, I'll gather signatures or somebody else anyway deadline question mark january 18th oh. that's the deadline for the for the articles to be yeah. to okay. be completed so we'll have to probably at our, at our next select board meeting we'll have to have a good sense of whether or not they're petitioning or not okay and the other issue that goes with this which is complicated is that there we're expecting another uh, or I've heard of another petition which is coming forward, which you've already sp spoken about a couple times this evening, which is about the idea of changing our meeting to another day. So the question for the select board becomes that there might be an article coming forward about changing the day of our meeting or going entirely to Australian ballot. That's confusing as far as I'm concerned, and it's not completely simple. And so if both those articles just go in front of the town, I'm not sure that we'll be able to figure out really well how best to go forward with the best thing. I mean, that's just my reaction. So we'll have to watch this. Uh, and we may choose, I'm just not saying anything like I think this is the way it should go, but I could imagine that the select board would choose not to bring forward the Australian ballot question if there's a petition to change the day of the meeting. We might not want to put those two things, we might not choose to put those two things together. Citizens can decide to do that if they want, that's out of our hands. 
but we may make different decisions, and that's what I expressed to Danielle. I don't know what the select board will do. We don't have to hammer it out this evening because we don't really know, but we don't have either petition. We only have a suggestion at this point. Any questions? <laughs> That's very no confusing. problem. <laughs> it's incredible. It's very confusing. Very, uh, you know. but the, is it clear enough? Do you understand what the issues yeah. are that we're kind of facing here? Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you know we're having such a collegial <clears throat> discussion among all of ourselves about this, and I hope that the expansion of the discussion will be as uh, considerate you know, as we have here, right. rather than a huge partisan issue. Did you want to say something very quick? Well, just a question. I, I assume then that if, if there is a petition but for both those articles, you would put them both on the town on the board. If they're a petition, they have to go yeah. on. We don't have a choice. <laughs> and that would be quite a discussion. Yeah. I'm not even sure that uh, I'm not, you know, if we had an informational meeting only <laughs> and we had a straight, it might really be really difficult for this town to figure out, uh, all of us, to figure out how to make the decision because it's not clear. Well, mm -hmm. might there be advice, let's say, from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns or somebody if you have two uh, almost contradictory uh, resident generated um, petitions? <laughs> I they did ask this question, and they they didn't want to put, make a put, put a value on either you know on, on the conflicting nature of those two things because they're not exactly at odds. Is what they said. Yeah, they're not exactly. Okay. And, and the two parties know that they're each doing this, so they know that they could be speaking to one another to try That's to figure right. this out out there before they bring it forward to us. Since neither has appeared, we might see neither. Yeah. You know. So we might see both. Uh, so I'm just not sure. So this is information that that has just that has gone to YouTube. Like, I mean, I, I read what the town clerk wrote, and she's bringing this. This is why it's on the yeah. agenda. Yeah. Okay. And so the additional changing of the town meeting is also that is something that we are aware. Sorry, son, of, yeah. of a, a citizen working on. Okay. Okay. Right so a citizen came in and said, "This is something that I might want to." Yeah. Yeah. It's not anything. We're not trying to manage it or anything. Yeah. We're just. Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering yeah. where it's coming from. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's an interesting kind of hit of yeah. two kind of ways of addressing what yeah. people are concerned about. Yeah. yeah. Inclusivity. Yeah. Is the, 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 the driver a, of yeah. both of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It feels. Yeah. Really, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, are we, anything else anybody else wants to say? I think we've, we've hit that as much as we can for tonight. All right. Okay, thank you all. It's, it's tough. Uh, now we'll uh, move ahead to the pre-town meeting, the informational meeting, which we have, just as a, 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 in our tradition, we've already talked about it a little bit, in our tradition, the Gopher Grange has uh, commonly convened a meeting, uh, and that will be, since we voted now to move forward with our regular town meeting, we'll collaborate with the Grange again. Mm -hmm. So, can we move it? That, huh? Can I make a motion? That we that we collaborate with the Guilford Grange to have pre town meeting and just move it uh, right along. Let's uh, yeah, I'm going to add one more thing okay. to that. We're going to add a date to it. <laughs> okay. All right. I want to check with everybody. We just, in the notion that this might be the case, we went ahead and talked to the Grange about possibilities. And again, it's all covered by spaces that the state allows for time. So we only have a certain number of days. So we've hit on Tuesday, February 27th, as the, as the at 6.30 in the evening. All right. So I would like that date to okay. be included in your motion. Okay. I move that we collaborate with the Grange on pre-town meeting on February 27th at Tuesday at 6.30. I'll second that. What was the January 8th date? That's our next meeting. Okay. Okay. I've got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
any discussion any further discussion about that okay um let me have voice vote on that all in favor please say aye aye, aye. any uh, uh, opposed any abstain all right thanks very much all right now we're going to add this one piece of business here to authorize our town administrator to make a renewal for the Algiers center village designation um, i'll make that motion a second okay. thank you michael uh, it's a simple process that we just need to do. There's a deadline for it. That's why we have to authorize her this evening. Um, is there anything that anybody wants to say or any questions? Easy enough? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay. All right. We move on to the warrants. Okay. I move to accept the warrants as written. Um, payroll week 12523 was $8,620.27. Payroll week 121023 was $7,787.19. Expense warrant number 2411 was $28,319.13. Expect expense warrant number 2411V was $1,136.03. And expense warrant number 2411P was $13,679.50 for a total of $59,542.12. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Anything you want us to know? Um, I just want you to know that this wasn't compared to the last one. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is peanuts. Um, but that, uh, Guardrails for $5,585 were purchased for Hinesburg Road and Guilford Center Road, which is wonderful. Sand was $3,591. A couple highway signs. Everything else was payroll, insurance, um, and that's about it. All right. And benefits. Thank you, Tara. Okay, um, all those in favor of paying these warrants, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, thanks very much. All right, we'll move on to other business, of which I think there is none. We'll move on through to correspondence, of which I'm not aware of any. Okay, I'm not aware of any. All right, then, the select board now needs to move into executive session. Uh, we have two motions we need to approve. We need to move into executive session to discuss um, labor relations okay. agreements with employees per 1 VSA section 313, A1B. So our action is we move into, uh, I will move that we move into executive session because premature knowledge of discussions could potentially put the town or the person, in, a person involved at significant disadvantage. So um, we need a second for that. I'll so, second. Thank Sorry. you, uh, Rusty. All right, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? All right, then we need to move into executive session uh, to discuss uh, labor relations uh, agreements with employees per 1 VSA section 313A1B, and we invite Erica Elder to participate. I'll make that motion. Is there a second? No, sir. Thanks again, Rusty. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, thank you. We are coming out of executive session here in a moment. It's now 8.50. I move that we come out of executive session at 8.50. Second. Thank you. All in favor of coming out? Aye. 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 Any nays? Any uh, abstentions? All right. All right. I then will further move that the uh, select board will, has agreed to uh, uh, place in the budget uh, figures as we discussed uh, during the session. We all understand what those are. So that will be my motion. Need a second. I'll second it. Thank you, Rusty. Is there any discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? All right, thank you. Now, move ahead. I'm sorry we have to go through this oh, part. Oh, the actions, right. From the previous meeting, 
Uh, bear with me, please. We approved minutes of the 11 13 23 meeting. We approved a subcommittee for the Conservation Fund, that's Michael and Zong. We approved a subcommittee for the MDR request, that's Veranda and Rusty. We authorized Erica to apply for a highway grant, which she has accomplished. We authorized regional planning letter of interest, which was sent. We authorized the 8% penalty for non filing of homestead declarations, and we approved the warrants. For this meeting, we uh, approved minutes. We uh, approved the fun uh, funding, uh, ARPA request funding for the emergency management director. Uh, we uh, voted uh, to uh, go forward with a regular town meeting on March 5th and not use Australian ballot for the 24 meeting. Uh, we uh, agreed to conduct a pre-town meeting on February 27th, that's Tuesday at 6.30. We authorize the town administrator to make renewal for the Algiers Center Village designation. That was an added item to the agenda per the board's uh, agreement. <coughs> and we approved uh, a, a budget uh, numbers to be placed uh, in the budget uh, 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 regarding uh, certain uh, member of this of the staff and we approved the warrant and we approved the warrants thank you very much mm -hmm. all right I think that that's all that we've done is there any further action to be taken by this August group no. thank you all very much that I will entertain an adjourn motion also moved. thank you Rusty second I'll second Thank you, Tara. And oh. happy Hanukkah to everybody. Yes, and they recall we don't have a meeting on Wednesday, December 27th. Um, our next meeting is January the 8th. And um, so all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Thank you very much. We are done. Uh. Appreciate this very much. So.